I am really delighted to, uh, to introduce my friend Massimo Fagioli, who probably needs no introduction for most of you. Massimo has been prolific, not just in his books, but also in his journalism. And over the last several years has been offering commentary on really the reality of the church from a global perspective. He has done extensive research on Vatican II, has got an exquisite book on that topic. He's also just published a book on the liminal papacy of Pope Francis, a gift actually that we will be giving to all of you. And um, we have in store for you uh, hopefully later on this week if the publisher uh, sends things as we've hoped. Um, Mazimo has been to my institution, Le Moyne College, a couple of times and really always brings to the audience um, a depth of insight rooted in his historical understanding of the church, but also a very keen insight into the reality of the church today. And he lives the role as a, a theologian and historian in the church as a calling. And I am just really privileged and grateful to, uh, to introduce him to you now. So Mazimo, if you would unmute yourself and I think you're ready to go. And we, uh, we have enabled your screen sharing if you want to uh, share any slides if you need to. Uh, we look forward to this input. Just a little bit of a word. At the end of the hour at uh, one o'clock when we conclude, uh, we'll invite people to take their lunch break. If you want to get together with your small group, if you're somewhere in the vicinity and want to join each other at a local restaurant, um, we wish we could have um, done that all in, in person, of course, with you. But um, uh, then at 2.30, we reconvene again for a wonderful session with John Dardis and Janine Turner of Georgetown University, who will continue to deepen this insight into the inner trilogue of the leader, of the discerning leader, the, the relationship between God, the self, and, um, and that soul uh, that calls us to be beyond our egos. Okay, so without that, without that, or besides that, or in light of that, Mazimo. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you, uh, if not in person, at least in voice and in image. Uh, I'm really honored to be part of this. And David is a great friend. And the Jesuits have played a big part in my life and in my career in these last few years, as I acknowledge in the book. Uh, so it's great to, to be here. Uh, I will not share PowerPoints because uh, in a semi-citation, power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. So I'm not <laughs> going to do that. Uh, but I sent my text to, to, to the organizers and it, it, it for your uh, use. Uh, and it's part of the work in progress on uh, on this present moment for the Catholic Church uh, talking about synodality. So here, as an historian and as an ecclesiologist, I have been trained in the, la in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s already, to think about uh, church institutions uh, of government. And I started hearing uh, about synodality 25 years ago, so when very few people were talking about that. And so when Pope Francis started talking about synodality again, uh, to my ears, but also to other specialists, uh, it, it really sounded as a great moment because it was a Pope who was finally receiving what theologians were saying uh, about the need of a certain completion and development of the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. So here, what I'm going to say in the next 30 minutes, more or less, is basically this. What it takes for the church to go from an ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council, which was mostly in terms of governance, about episcopal collegiality, mm -hmm. to the present moment where we are experiencing, I think, uh, something like an Episcopal synodality to the next step, uh, step three, which is the vision uh, of Pope Francis uh, that he has articulated of an ecclesial synodality. So here, 
we are in the middle of of this of this uh, three steps from collegiality among bishops to synodality in the church and what it means to make this transition. So here, Vatican II is the absolutely necessary first step to talk about synodality, even though in the corpus of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, the word synodality doesn't appear. So we have synod, uh, the bishop synod or diocesan synods, uh, but there's no word synodality. Why is that? Mostly because the Second Vatican Council was concerned with a completion of the ecclesiology of the First Vatican Council or Vatican Council, uh, 1869 1870, which uh, elevated the papacy at a, at a very high level in terms not just uh, dogmatically, but also of, of the perception in the Catholic Church. And so Vatican I left uh, the Catholic Church in this uh, necessity, also because Vatican I was interrupted uh, because of the invasion of Rome and the fall of, of, the, of, of the papal states. Vatican I was interrupted when only the first part of the Constitution on Ecclesiology had been debated and approved the section on the papacy. What had not been discussed and what had not been approved was this section on the bishops. And so here Vatican II, in some sense, received this task from an interrupted council to rediscover a certain uh, vision for the role of, of the bishops theologically, but also for their role in the governance of the Catholic Church. And so here Vatican II says many things on the role of bishops, both in their local churches and as members of, of, of the college of bishops, uh, about their tasks and their uh, uh, ecclesiological role, which is a mix of modern understanding of what bishops are as prefects of local churches, as cooperators of, of the bishop, of, of the Pope, but also, so there's an element of ressourcement, of, of going back to the early churches, to to the age of, of the fathers uh, of, the, of the church, but it's an idea of church governance that is extremely focused on the bishops. And it, it involves very minimally other members of the church, mm -hmm. the clergy, but also lay people, because lay people in the ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council, they are reactivated, they are energized, but mostly for what they can do in the world, not in the church. That's one of the things that has changed in our perception of the church and of the world as well. So here Vatican II uh, has a limited task to rebalance papacy and episcopacy um, and in a limited way to create some institutions of collegiality at the local level in the decree Christus Dominus, which was the subject of my first book, but always again as an extension of, 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 of Episcopal power. So here, one of, of the jokes of the Second Vatican Council was that bishops were so eager to get from the papacy rights that the same bishops were not available to give to their priests. This is exactly true. This is what Vatican II was about, and it's one of the limitations, uh, obviously, of that ecclesiology. So here, synodality at Vatican II is part of that vision, but mostly implicitly. And so there is an ecclesiology of the people of God, uh, of the local church, and of the papacy that grants 
incredible opportunities to develop a synodal vision of the church, but again, they must be extracted, developed from, from a language that is not explicitly synodal. And we can see that from the most visible I mean, linguistic attachment between Vatican II and synodality, which is the Synod of the Bishops, which was created by Paul VI in September 1965 at the opening of the fourth and final session of the Second Vatican Council, which was the attempt of the papacy to receive some ideas of the Second Vatican Council for a more collegial church, but at the same time, honestly, Paul VI was, was afraid of the radical nature of some proposals for a bishop synod. So he preempted Vatican II from going forward with more radical options. So here, one of the problems of the Catholic Church dealing with synodality today is that the most visible institution that Francis has rediscovered in an incredibly powerful way, unique, is the, is the, is the Bishop Synod, which has the name Synod, but it has, in the way it was conceived by Paul VI in 1965, little to do with synodality, because it's much more about collegiality of the bishops between themselves and with the Pope, then with Ecclesia Synodality, which is different because it's about um, a way of governing the Ecclesia Communion between all members of the church, bishops and non-bishops. And so here we have a, a linguistic difficulty because Synodality is now mostly visible in the Catholic Church and, and I don't want to underestimate. This is incredibly important, but again, we have to pay the price of an institution that was created not to serve synodality, but to serve episcopal collegiality. And so this is the original sin, if, 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 if we can speak in this way, of the contemporary mm -hmm. uh, language on, uh, on church governance and uh, synodality. So here, uh, this focus on the bishops is one of the great assets of the Second Vatican Council and all, also of the weaknesses right now. Why asset? Because after Vatican II, we have the development of institutions that are really modern like the bishop conferences that have played an incredibly important role, especially, for example, for the implementation of the, of the liturgical reform. So here, one can say that the bishop conferences are the development of the councils or synod of the early centuries. I don't believe that very much because bishop conferences are a modern institution that is an ecclesial response to the creation of nation states, which didn't exist in the third, fourth, fifth century. And so that has been an incredibly important development, uh, so which I believe is inevitable to keep for the future. But at, at the same time, that same very strong focus on the episcopacy uh, meant some costs because, for example, in the life of local churches, the collegial and synodal uh, dynamics has been, let's say, applied in very different ways. So here we have historically the golden age of the post-Vatican II uh, season of uh, local synods or national synods in the 70s, basically. And then everything uh, loses energy for various reasons. And so here we, we still have a very important role for bishop conferences, but one of, of, of the challenges of today is how to revive local institutions of church governance that are sometimes collegial, 
the presbyteral council, for example, or synodal, the pastoral councils, uh, diocesan synods, that as some recent uh, surveys show, uh, have been implemented um, in very, very different ways. Uh, and most of the time uh, at the will of the local bishop, honestly, uh, so without a real commitment to this fundamental synodal uh, dimension of the local church. So here, what we need to do is to consider what could have been done in the post-Vatican II period mm -hmm. and what uh, has been done and what uh, has not been done. Because this is a, a recurrent phenomenon in the history of the Catholic Church. So we have, for example, after the Council of Trent, in that century after Trent, in the 17th century, a revival of uh, local diocesan synods, local, local councils, plenary councils, national councils, but then everything dies out for the fear uh, of the creation of, uh, of national churches. And so here the papacy in the 17th, 18th century becomes increasingly worried that the creation of national churches will break the unity of the Catholic Church. And so everything is called back again to Rome in a process of centralization. Something like that happens after Trent, four centuries ago, and something similar happens after Vatican II, or in some sense, even today, if you have heard recently what has, is being said on the synodal path in Germany, well, it's the same problem that comes back again and again in the Catholic Church. I mean, how to implement locally uh, the processes and how to maintain unity. So one of the aspects that makes our situation different today is that after Trent, we did not have a theology of the local church. And so four centuries ago, forgetting local synods was morally and theologically less serious than today. I believe it's more problematic today to forget that local dimension because we have now a very solid understanding of the ecclesiology of the, of the local church, which is based on a Eucharistic ecclesiology and so on. So here there are some urgent tasks that cannot be dismissed by saying, well, that happened already four centuries ago. I mean, this is now more serious than four centuries ago. So here there is, a, I, I think, an historical problem uh, of being honest in what happened after Vatican II, what was successful and what uh, wasn't, also because very clearly uh, that assessment is distinct but cannot be separated from a certain moral but also institutional reckoning of the sex abuse crisis. Because, I mean, synodality has become so important today, not just because it's the nice thing to do, but because in many local churches, it has become much more urgent because there's no, there's no future for some local churches that is not synodal, I think. I, I, I think about Australia, for example, but also Germany, I mean, countries that have been ravaged by the sex abuse crisis, the synodality, is the only available theological response that I believe is Catholic other than uh, purely technocratic solutions like, like a post-Episcopal church, a, a church with no bishops, no, no ordained ministry. This is something that I believe would be much more costly for the Catholic church while synodality is there and it's the way to uh, to go. Um, so uh, here, I believe that this moment in this pontificate with Francis is a crucial moment because here, also because of Pope Francis' understanding of the Second Vatican Council, 
which is uh, typical of his background and it is not concerned with uh, too much the uh, philosophical uh, niceties of, 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 of the hermeneutics of that kind or the other kind. So he is a son of the Second Vatican Council because there's no understanding of the church in Latin America without the Second Vatican Council. And what has been typical of the church in Latin America after Vatican II is a much more courageous implementation of the Second Vatican Council also in its synodal elements or, or collegial elements beginning from the activity of, of the CELAM, of, of, of the Consejo uh, Episcopal Latinoamericano, but also experiences of uh, of, uh, uh, of synodal events uh, in the whole continent. So this is, I believe, an incredibly important moment because it is the example of what, of how rich can be the de-Europeanization of Catholicism. I mean, getting out of this European matrix, which as an Italian, I have no intention to deny, but it must be integrated. It must be enriched with a truly global dimension of, 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 of the Catholic Church. So also because, and we have seen this very clearly in all Pope Francis encyclical, is that for Francis synodality is not only an ecclesial, ecclesiastical concern, it's a key element of the relationship between the church and the modern world. So here, the, I believe that the, one of the most amazing speeches of Francis was the one given just I mean, five years ago, uh, three days ago, October 17, 2015, which is his Magna Carta of Synodality. And the last paragraph says, the way of the church of being synodal will be, a, and I'm quoting by heart, a, like a standard lifted up to this world where decisions more and more are made by small group of people. So it's inseparable from his concern for the church in the modern world that has something to do and something to, to say in a different way from what our political parties, our national leaders, um, those who make decisions in the world that are no longer parliament, of course, but are Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple. So small group of people, non-transparent, invisible, unaccountable, and with a series of concerns that are totally different from the common good. So here, I believe this is an incredibly fruitful moment and so there is a vision and there is a spirit i believe as, as i said many times there are a few canonical institutional hurdles to be addressed which is this that our institutions of synodal governance and of synodal uh, church which is not just about governance but it's a way of being church are still mostly shaped by an ecclesiology that is or has become Episcopalist. And so this is one of, of the great paradoxes mm -hmm. of the Second Vatican Council and post Vatican II. So here at Vatican II, 60 years ago, the greatest insight and the greatest victory of Vatican II was to solve the problem of the church, we need a more powerful elite of bishops. This is how we can solve this. This is the silver bullet of the Second Vatican Council. And back then it was, I believe, accurate. Six years ago, we know that that is now a limited vision. So here we need institutions of synodality, at the local level, at the diocesan level, at the intermediate level, at 
national level and at the central level in Rome that find a way to keep the apostolicity of the church. And so I don't believe this church is ready to become post-episcopal, but at the same time, to see the participation of other members of the church that is not just like a sprinkle on the cake, because this is the problem, because this is what tends to happen. And of course, of, of course, the major I mean, symbolical issue is the role of, of women in the Catholic Church. So here, how can we address this? So here Francis has started doing that because, for example, in, in the way he has uh, uh, understood and led the Bishop Synod between 2014 and last year in practice and in the documents that he has issued for the new shape of uh, for the Bishop Synod, especially um, Episcopalis Communio of 2018, he has made provisions for the addition of members of the Synod, I mean, voting members that are non-bishops, with some limits though. So this is something we should continue because it's hardly imaginable for me as he, the next step of synodality in the Catholic Church, where, where synodality is just a nice name for collegiality in the 21st century. I believe this is the problem. So we need to maintain a certain role for bishops in the local churches, at the bishop conference, at the national level, at the bishop synod in Rome, but again, we should distinguish between what is a synod of the Catholic Church, a bishop synod, and something different, which is the general council. The council, once called ecumenical council of the Catholic Church, where membership is for bishops only. So what we see right now is, I believe, the beginning of a distinction between a body that is uh, episcopal only, the council or bishop conferences, and the synods that are becoming more diverse. And so we see that uh, slowly uh, at the bishop synod. But for example, if one looks at Australia, the plenary council, it's an institution that formally uh, is about making bishops able to vote on things, but the whole process has been shaped by the, the, the entire people of God of, of Australia. So this is something that I believe deserves and needs encouragement from Rome, uh, the Plenary Council of, of, of Australia, as well as the uh, in synodal path um, in German. So here there is, I believe, that kind of, of obstacle that uh, has to be uh, overcome because mostly when we hear, especially from bishops, I mean, talking about synodality, most of them, they have just substituted the term collegiality with synodality, but they are, I mean, uh, theologically, they are different things because the collegiality includes a certain elite in the Catholic Church, the Episcopal elite, and synodality involves the whole people of God. And so this is, in ecclesiological terms, a very different thing, but also institutionally, they are different things. The problem is that all bodies of governors in the Catholic Church that are non-monarchical, so not the bishops alone, not the Pope alone, they are a collegial uh, body of more than one bishop, more than just the Pope, because means the Pope 
and bishops. So we need to understand how to do that on the one side, on the other side, without falling into the temptation on which Francis, I believe, is growing more concerned in this last year or so of turning synodality into a technocratic uh, mechanism. And so this is important to avoid because uh, it would be a very important, a very, very serious shortcut. And so I, I believe that we are at, at this juncture uh, here. So I will conclude with just uh, one final uh, 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 thought here, just to recap my first point. So here, historically, in Catholicism, we have seen in these last 10 centuries, the second millennium, a very high papacy that after Trent has tried to become less papalist and more episcopalist, at Vatican II, at Vatican I, we, we have a resurgence of papacy. Vatican II rebalances papacy and episcopacy in canonical terms, but also at a symbolical level. We need to get out of the second millennium and enter into the third millennium, finally, because we are in the third millennium, and imagining collegiality as one, as one way of governing the church that is not at the expense of synodality. This is, I believe, very important, and it, it can be done, it must be done, because collegiality was still relying on a certain endorsement or support of the secular state, which is now gone. So this church needs to stand up by herself with all its members, without relying on the alliances between the altar and the throne, elites, Episcopal elites, political elites. This is a different kind of church. And I don't think synodality is a luxury, is actually on the top of the grocery shopping list, I believe, in the Catholic Church of today. And I would stop here because I think it's important to have some time for exchange. Thank you for your patience. Mazimo, thank you. You're seeing some people's applause for the very thoughtful inputs. You know, you stimulated so many things for me as you identify what is happening in an epical change historically just around our very conceptualizations of leadership, that we're moving from the individual heroic mode, which sufficed for, for many places and times, to a team sport, that leadership has to be a collective uh, action. Um, if I may say as a friend too, um, and you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but as you identified the inspiration of Pope Francis, really bringing synodality forward in this way, in response to our times. I, I think I experienced you moved, brother. Uh, yeah. And, and I think that um, this very much speaks to what we're trying to pay attention to as church leaders, to notice the movement of spirit within us when our hearts are really connecting to something bigger than what we have as our current reality, something that pulls us forward, sempre avanti. Um, without letting go of the preciousness of the past. So, so sincere thanks to you, and sincere thanks. I would like people just to take a minute to write down uh, a thought or question in your journals that Mazimo has stimulated or provoked or inspired by his, uh, his comments. And then we're going to open it up in plenary and also in the chat. So um, one minute, just to take a note down, not to let the extroverts uh, rule of the day when we get into the plenary and to have some thoughts that you'd like to offer either in chat form or in the, the plenary form. Okay, so just one minute.
Okay, so I would like to open this space up for you to, um, to offer your comments by either writing in the chat uh, or by um, offering your comments by raising your hand. Uh, I see a couple of hands raised now. I'm going to move to the, um, the active speaker format, which will toggle back and forth between a kind of a group view and uh, the individual. Um, and uh, again, Sandra will kind of keep track of the comments in the chat. I'll try to keep track of the hands. Uh, and uh, Peter, would you unmute yourself for your first comment? Thank you, David, and I hope you can hear me well. My connection is rather weak. And thank you, Massimo, for this um, really provocative um, presentation. At least that's what I, um, what I receive, and it's a good provocation because it makes me or hope us think and also feel. A question or a comment, isn't Pope Francis rather an exception? in terms of synodality, because we have seen papacy before, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's not that much different of what has been or had been there before after Francis. You also mentioned the example of German and Australian bishops conference. And uh, I think those two are more exceptional. I would be more convinced if there were like 30 or 40 bishops conference that you would talk about in this direction. I will give you two examples from Europe. I cannot mention countries, one from the center of Europe and one from the west of Europe in the last meetings of Bishop's Conference. It's collegiality. It's, as you say, a small group of people that need to take decisions on how to deal with COVID in terms of Eucharist in the churches. That's their main concern. Second concern is usually something going back with sex abuse. And that's most of the things they can or want to talk about. This is really a small team. You know, eight people for the entire country, or let's say in the other case, uh, 12 or so. And I, and I don't see much of synodality there, where you would invite the priests and religious and lay people uh, to talk about these uh, issues. And then of course, what you get is a lot of frustration. Even Pope Francis, when he, for example, and this is my opinion, of course, only, um, with the synod on, on Amazonia, at the end, he had to strike balance. You know, there was a lot of talk about uh, ordaining a woman to priesthood. And there was, uh, or uh, even more about viri probati. And he had to strike balance. And I think it was prudent uh, move. So I wouldn't, actually I would see him more of a, as an exception. I hope it would be different. Thank you. Can I reply right now? Yeah, so you're right. I, I just don't think we should be uh, reluctant to uh, accept uh, a gift like, like the a, a exceptionality of, of Pope Francis. So you're right. So what's happening, it's too little in the global church. Uh, I follow what's happening in, in Italy. And five years ago, Pope Francis gave a very stern speech to the Italian bishops, you should start synodal process in five years. I mean, they're still talking about the weather, basically. So this is true, you're right. I believe that there's no alternative in this sense. As an historian, or all historians can tell you that the church has never changed because of her good will. It's always been because of an enormous external pressure. Now, I don't think that there is a future for the Catholic Church behaving in the collegial small elite groups. That, I believe, and it's not this pontificate or this decade, it's this century and, and the next one. So here, I believe that there is something that can be done and um, thank God, I mean, Francis has Jesuits uh, that are helping him because there's not much else going on. Honestly, you're right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not denying what's, um, and I've, I wrote what, that I believe Pope Francis was too cautious in receiving the Amazon Synod because there could be something that could, could have been done uh, that he chose not to for many reasons, right? So 
I I just outlined the, uh, the theological uh, institutional problem. Now I I think we can kick that can down the road for a, another pontificate. I just don't think that the situation will be better in five or ten years. Um, so um, uh, it is an exception, but. In some sense, every pope is, is, is an exception. So here, I believe that Antuti Frate, uh, the encyclical of uh, Francis could not have been imagined without Pope John, who was pope for five years or less. Uh, and we're still talking about that. I suspect something like that will happen with Francis even after he is gone. I, mean, I, I don't think that can be reversed, honestly. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask if um, Antoinette would go next. We have several folks who are putting comments and questions into the chat. Um, and it's very important, again, that we have a wide diversity of views are respected and included here. <clears throat> One of the powerful things about synodality from a discerning leadership perspective is it's not about the imposition of a particular uh, method or I'm sorry a, a particular ideology but it's a methodology for inclusion and and we want to respect that as a way of proceeding as a group so knowing that the hour is uh, is near and people may be so engaged by this that they want to stay on for a little while Mazimo can I check with you do you have a hard stop at the top of the hour um, I have a hard stop at 15 minutes after the hour. Perfect. Okay. Great. So, Antoinette. Thank you very much, Massimo. I would think uh, where I'm sitting, I think synodality is very now is the way to go for us as congregations, as leaders, whereby we need the participation of our members, participation of the voice of each and every person in different way in this discernment process. So I, I see it's very, very important. And also, but to also to go back to what it was nice that Massimo talked about the historical and what is going, we are, we are the church. At the same time, the, the implementation in the church is going to take quite a long time. Because uh, when, when we look at the things as a, when, where I'm standing as a woman, I find that uh, sometimes uh, we are not disfranchised in this. Um, in, in this. So I think uh, it's, a way, it's a way that we we'll like all to go. I would like to learn, as Massimo said, we are not going back. We either grow into that or not. But it's a, a long way because I, I, could, I could just remember how the Synod of the Family was, was done. And I saw a lot of cardinals and whatever, and, but I didn't see women well represented and also lay people well represented. And uh, that one is also, and it just provokes in me that spirit that we need as leaders also to, to work towards that. So you're, you're, you're right. So I believe that if synodality wants to be credible, and honestly, if Pope Francis wants to be credible on synodality, it must be about women. So it's something that must be done. It's not something that we should talk about because we know the sound of that. It must be done. I have a nine-year-old daughter. And I never talked to her yet on the issue of women in the church, but sometimes she comes up with things that she doesn't feel that she's going to be part of a certain structure of the church. And I've never addressed that issue, never. But it's something that she sees. And she's, she's not particularly churchy, but I mean, it's there. So you're right. It's about insistence, and it's about, uh, I believe, it is really on the path towards a workable future. 
that's, I mean, if you talk to a Catholic woman in, in Australia, my age or slightly older, she will tell you, we have lost two generations already. And if we lose this one, well, we're done. I mean, it, it will become a series of monuments and of statues and saints and names, but it will not be there. So here, how to do, how to do that? I have, I'm on the record and I said always that a, an easy thing to do theologically is women deacons. And also because that would give us some room not to clericalize women, but to acknowledge what they do already in many, many cases. So you're right. Um, I've learned a lot as a male European theologian who, so when I was studying, we were never given books written by women. And, 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 and I was born 50 years ago. So it's not that long ago. So I was part of that problem. And, and I think I'm learning together with many others. And so this is happening. And, um, and I see that this language has become mainstream. It was not mainstream five years ago, I can guarantee you. It was not, now it is. I mean, not women priesthood specifically, but women in the church right now, if you wanna be credible, you have to say something on that. If you don't wanna say anything, well, it's a museum church that I don't think it's, it's worth investing too much, honestly. Okay, thank you, Mark. So Sandra is going to uh, share with us some of the questions and comments that have come up in the chat. Um, she'll take them as a group for you to uh, consider and respond to, and then we'll return to uh, Giovanni. Thank you so much, Massimo. Uh, I mean, it's clear from the engagement on the chat how much your sharing has provoked insights and questions. And um, I'm sure most of them uh, are not something to be answered now in 10 minutes. So I will just share a few uh, and perhaps you can give a few words or group them. So there was a question about, um, is there a conflict in the Catholic Church between collegiality and synodality, like some bishops not encouraging it? And if so, or if there are some resistances, why are we afraid of it? So there was something along this line. Uh, another thing was uh, around um, how to avoid that synodality becomes an imposition of a specific agenda. And I'll add a third one and perhaps um, you, can, you can answer and then we'll move to other questions. And uh, the third one was um, how can we move forward respecting the different roles of member, keeping in mind the fear of uh, division among the church? So on the first question, I think what is urgent is an education for bishops that became priest and then bishop when not just nodadi but even collegiality was a dangerous word and so it's it's a problem because if you check in dictionaries or library catalogs synodality is a word that in the catholic teaching of the church doesn't exist before francis so it's, it's, it, it's, it's necessary a process of, of, of education. The agenda is this. So I, I don't believe there's an agenda that is being manufactured. Do we want to have a church that wants to be able to evangelize with all its forces or not? And so here we are not enforcing an agenda of uh, baptizing aliens that we don't know if they exist. Next. So this is, so this is about visible members of the church, visible members of the church. And so this is not an agenda, I believe, or if it's an agenda, I subscribe to it. <laughs> so I, I don't think it, it is particularly ideological. The third, um, I believe that this, is a contentious issue, yes. But again, 
if you deny the synodal element in the history of the spirituality and in the history of the institutions of the Catholic Church, you are denying Catholicism. So, I mean, you're free to do it, but don't lecture us about Catholicism because synodality is integral part of a, an experience of church locally, universally, individually. I mean, you can subscribe to an imperial agenda when you want Charlemagne to govern the whole world and the church for you. Sorry, that was just a moment in the history of the Catholic Church, it's much longer. So here there is, I believe what's needed is to make a strong argument for the Catholicity of that, for the traditional nature of it, which is traditional. It's the language that we need to update and, to, and the institutions that we need to update. But I challenge anyone to tell me uh, the, the idea of a communion within the church of people walking together is unorthodox. I, 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 I would be curious to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, uh, there are some questions as well about the terminology itself. So uh, seeing synodality as perhaps a tainted uh, word and um, many are asking, uh, is, is it worth the effort to deconstruct this terminology in order to really capture the spirit needed for the church government's uh, governance? I think it's, it's, the, it's the best bad word we have, <laughs> honestly. And it's good <laughs> enough because it can distinguish from collegiality on the ecclesial side and from democracy or liberal democracy on the other side, which is in a lot of trouble, as we know. So his modality is traditional because in church history for centuries, council, synods, gathering, it's a very common uh, semantic area. So I, I think it must be used more often and it must be associated with institutions that are not just the bishops synod in the Vatican with the Pope, it must be encouraged. So one of, of the suggestions that in the Australian report we gave to the Australian bishops, and I was one of the advisors, is let's go back to the, the requirement for every diocese to have a diocesan synod every number of years, which is not Vatican II, which, which, which is not George Soros or, or Bill Gates, is the Council of Trent, because Trent required that and it, was, it has never been implemented. So here there is, I believe, a, a necessity to use it more often and more accurately. I think that other terms would, would be more artificial. Yeah, thank you. And the final question, uh, because there are many questions about moving forward. So you mentioned something about uh, the education of bishops. Um, many have pointed to the pressures that are perhaps moving, speeding up the process. Do you have anything to add about how to speed this up, how to uh, involve the voice of non-clerics, women, how to move forward towards synodality besides educating? So I, I'm I have a concern that we will arrive at the Bishop's Synod on Synodality in 2022 in this situation. So something must happen in the next 24 months at the central level in Rome, at the national level. So here, I believe that signals coming from Rome would be very important because we need to arrive at the Synod on Synodality in 2022, in a situation where it's not just about let's learn the word synodality, because I believe that should have happened by 2022. So it must, so I think that a synod can be prepared, something that we saw with the synod on the youth, and Sister Natalie will talk about that later. So there is, so here, Rome has the ability, the authority, and the assets to prepare that synod. And honestly, what I'm doing and what you're doing here 
it's part of that, but that needs to happen before 2022 because by then it, it will be late. Thank you. I hope I captured most of your questions. Uh, David, you want to call Giovanni? I will uh, reduce my sound. Giovanni, you have oh. your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo, for your presentation. Just a, a practical question from the point of view of leaders. We are talking about synodal leaders. So it's no question that synodality is a gift to the church that we have to rediscover. But as leaders, uh, we have the responsibility to direct this process in the right direction because the, the challenge here, I think one of the challenges is to keep a right balance um, in the sense that uh, um, the risk of some people who have embraced enthusiastically synodality, but without discernment, without we, we are speaking about discernment. And in this way, uh, it seems that uh, uh, truth is something that emerges from synodality. Uh, in this way, we create the truth about all the themes that we are discussing in every synodal event, as opposed to other people who uh, think that uh, we have to accept to uh, follow a truth that is has been given to us and in this sense synodality is the process to, to recognize to discern how to be faithful to this uh, truth so the question is as leaders what um, what would you su suggest how, what criteria would you give to a leader to keep this balance so this is important. Uh, so that's why we use the, uh, the word synodality and not democracy, because in democracy, the idea is that we create what's true and what's good. And so synodality is it's not about creating it, but it, 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 it's about recognizing it. So you're right, so there has to be uh, a moment of uh, discernment and, and of decision ultimately that is made by someone who's not necessarily the assembly. So here there is, uh, so one criterion is for example to make decisions not by majority but with a, a consensus, which is uh, so-called sometimes moral unanimity. It was the criteria adopted by Paul VI at Vatican II, which was new because all councils before they voted with a majority, period. <laughs> and so Paul VI was more concerned, said we need a moral unanimity, so which, not, which did not save him from the schism of the Lefebvreite, but that's another chapter. So we need to come up with uh, processes that can really preserve synodality from the, uh, the mob rule or the instant decision, this is not. So here there are criteria. So is there something that can be decided and it's sound in light of the tradition, not of, of, of the recent teachings, but of the tradition and of scripture? And, and we have criteria. So I believe that is a problem. My, my first problem now is that we are very far from that moment because this process must be initiated. And so I think that there is much more common sense in the, in the people of God than we assume. So I, I point again your attention to what's happening in Australia, the plenary council and the final report of this task force is nothing of the radical craziness like let's abolish priesthood let's abolish there's nothing like that it's much more moderate much more pragmatic 
because if you build a process, I believe you can tap into the common sense of the people. If you pretend that those emergencies don't exist, this is when you will have the craziness coming out, I think. Okay, so Mazimo, thank you. And thank you, Giovanni, for that question. As we bring our, our time together to a close, um, this final question is very pertinent to our program. Um, it would be, it would certainly be grandiose and arrogant to suggest that our discerning leadership program is intended to address precisely this issue, but it's exactly what we are here and intending to do is not just to foster the mindsets of conversion, which Pope Francis has described and which Mazimo has indicated are very different from the technical bureaucratic ways of making change. They're the mindsets that also must be expressed through skill sets, so capacities and competencies for what we call discerning leadership in common. And this is what yields this kind of um, moral consensus that Mazamo has just described. It is, um, it is not rule by majority. And um, as we see that rule by even majority increasingly jeopardized and, um, and, and really um, corrupted uh, in today's politics because of power players, we also have to recognize that right now in the church, there are the increasing numbers of lobbies, which are very powerfully resourced, that are on the right and on the left. And they, uh, as has always been the case, political forces jockeying for their own imposition of, of values, and also their own imposition of, of agendas, often self-interested or not in service of the whole, but simply a part of the whole. Um, our approach and our commitment is to do something very different. In line with what Pope Francis is advocating, our commitment is to foster the spirit of mutuality um, and this collaborative discernment process, which is not simply a, a kind of postmodern construction of reality, but it's to acknowledge that God is constantly incarnate and actively at work in the moment with us, and that we are co-creating together the reality of the church. This inherits the past and also moves on and makes present the future that God wants to make manifest through us. Um, this is a process that's mysterious and nothing that can be captured uh, as if we're taking a historical snapshot and saying, this is the church. Uh, in fact, it's a dynamic and unfolding reality that we are very much a part of at this liminal moment as uh, Massimo has used that expression during this liminal time, during this liminal papacy, as the church moves into a, a multipolar reality that's truly global, that's decolonized in a sense from a kind of uh, Eurocentricity, a Roman centricity. This will inevitably, and as we know in our own experiences, generate conflict, controversy, loss, fear, um, and, and conflict, certainly. So uh, as we are exploring these issues, I think what Massimo has helped us to do is realize through his analysis that um, there are truly uh, aspects that we have inherited as church, which has, have been facilitating factors in the direction of synodality. And there are parts of the monarchical church left over from the medieval times that also need to be converted. And those are not just mindsets. Those are all real structures and policies as well. Mazamo, am I on the right track? Uh, yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> so so I, I don't want to suggest that we are trying to impose any agenda, but as Pope Francis has called for a process orientation as to how we might move toward the future, this is what we want to, to build, is the, the capacity of each of us and all of us to do just that. Um, we will talk, you know, later on today about the inner trialogue uh, that we face as leaders as we confront our own fears and our own attachments, um, the voices that sabotage and undermine us because we want to hold on to what we know. Um, and they are writ large when we discuss, you know, how this evolves as, as a community, as a church, made so much more complex by our global reality. Uh, then 
Natalie's talk this afternoon, and it's really beautiful. Mazamo and Natalie are premier theologians who have both collaborated over the last week to actually create a kind of dialogue with each other. And that in itself is modeling the kind of interdependent synodality that we desire to manifest through our leadership. Um, it, I've shared with the two of them, from my perspective, this models the kind of relationship that the Greek Orthodox describe in the Trinity, like a co-inherent you know, dance that acknowledges interdependence and, and that really is constantly co-creating together. So that's a lot of terminology to throw at you just before we go to lunch. Um, but uh, I want you to join me in uh, offering uh, gratitude to, uh, to Mazumo. Certainly we have our little uh, applause functions, but if you have notes that you'd like to share with him in the chat, what we will do is we will compile those notes and send them on to him as a thank you. Um, and so we also, as we're thanking you, and we do, Mosmo. It is a joy to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and and again, I'm going to offer my own little uh, little happy face here. Uh, Mosmo, ci vediamo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.